Hello, everyone. My name is Becky Robinson. I'm the founder and CEO of Weaving Influence, and I am so thrilled to be with Art Barter today as we talk about his latest book, The Art of Servant Leadership 2. We're so glad that you've joined us. And as we get started, uh, I want to share a few technical considerations with you. But first, welcome, Art. I'm so glad you're investing your time with us today. Hi, Becky. Great to be with everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, looking forward to spending the, the next uh, um, 40, 50 minutes with you, just uh, having a great time, hanging out and, and talking yeah. about the book. Yeah. Yes, that would be awesome. So well, as we're getting started, I would love to invite all of you to take a look at the question panel because toward the end of today's broadcast, we are going to be answering your questions. And I noticed already that we have one um, already listed. So if you could take a moment and get acquainted with the question panel and go ahead and type in, let us know where you're calling in from today, geographically, or if you happen to be tuning in as part of an organization, watching in a group for professional development, we would love to know that as well and give a shout out to your organization. So welcome in Seattle, in Orange, California, in Scottsdale, Arizona, Rochester, Minnesota, Denver, Dallas, Tampa, Southeast Michigan, that's someone on my team, uh, San Diego, San Francisco, um, Edinburgh, Texas, Joliet, St. Louis, Missouri, Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, there's a women's leadership group in West Des Moines, Iowa, looks like okay. Ontario, Charleston. Uh, Sacramento. Uh, there are some Board of Education members and superintendents gathered. Um, more Maryland, California, Mississippi. Wow, uh, we have lots of folks from lots of places. Uh, welcome to all of you. It's going to be a great conversation today on the topic of servant leadership, and we're so glad that you joined us. We will uh, have today's slides available as a PDF in our follow-up materials. And we are recording today's session. So in the event that you would like to share the session with a colleague or friend, you will be able to send out the link of this event. Uh, the other thing is uh, some folks love to join us in the conversation over on Twitter. So if you'd like to live tweet your insights today, we'd ask you to use the hashtag servant leadership. And if you can grab Art's Twitter handle and include that in any of your tweets. I think I've covered everything, um, but if you have any questions about the technology today, feel free to put those in the question panel as well. So as I mentioned, Art Barter is the author of a brand new book, The Art of Servant Leadership 2. His previous books include Farmer Abel and The Servant Leadership Behavior Journal. Did I get the title on that one right? I should know. <laughs> you did, bring Becky. Yep, you absolutely did, yep. Uh, Art has uh, been serving as the CEO at Daytron World Communications since he acquired it back in 2004. And with his team, he has seen amazing financial and uh, life uh, quality results um, through his work at Daytron. He's also the founder and CEO of the Servant Leadership Institute and uh, a husband and father and all around great guy. So. Art, I'm so thrilled to have this conversation with you today. Yeah, thank you, Becky, for the nice words. It's uh, it's been an amazing journey, and uh, it's one that I wish someone, you know, back when I was in college, would have put servant leadership in front of me. I'm not sure I would have been ready for it, uh, but um, uh, you know, it it struck me in my early 50s, and uh, it it's I've been a different person, different leader because of it, and it's just been an amazing journey. So, um, yeah. Well, so folks who read the book will get to hear a little bit about your initial exposure to servant leadership um, right before you purchased Datron back in around 2003 when Ken Blanchard spoke at your church. So what what an amazing pivotal moment that must have been. It was. I, I had never met Ken personally up until that night and uh, met him personally. was very impressed with him because someone asked him if he brought some books to sell. And he says, you know, I, I didn't come here to, to sell books. I came here to teach. And I saw Ken Blanchard, the teacher, and the one who wanted to just pour into people's lives show up that night. And he spoke to me pretty directly and succinctly. And uh, he's, be, he's become a good friend, a good mentor. I've been very fortunate to have him guide me um, and get me started in the servant leadership journey. So, yeah, he's, he's the one that challenged me and planted the seed and really encouraged me to be a different type of leader. Yeah. And that That's was in, anyway, it was in 2003. Yeah, 2003. 
year before we well, got um, the company. So we're going to dive in today. And for those of you who are uh, watching later or who are with us live, we're going to be walking through um, basically the chapters in this new book and the key uh, concepts that Art and his team followed to implement servant leadership at H1. So I'm really excited about that. And we're going to start um, with this idea of connect, what communicate, um, create and communicate. And what, what what I was really struck with, Art, when I was reading this section in the book was um, that you talked about not only the importance of creating company vision and communicating with your team about how the vision is lived out in the company. And I was really struck with some of the examples that you shared, Art, about the way that you share the work that Daytron is doing around the world with your team. Could you share with us a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, what I discovered was the power of the stories. And when you start sharing the stories of the customers that you've impacted and how they make a difference in people's lives, uh, that's when people really start to understand that maybe you're just not creating a product and selling a product. You're actually helping lives become better. And so we started sharing the stories from where I went out and visited with customers or I saw that they were um, uh, responding well, et cetera. And I went, you know, it's, um, um, it was very, very powerful for them to understand the impact they had in the products that they were selling. And so um, coming back and sharing with them what the company was doing, how they were doing it and the impact, and we, we basically helped them understand that through the products they generate and ship they were actually helping save lives through great communication so other types of things didn't have to be used and that's when people really started to understand the power of what we were doing as a company that that sells radios and sells communications equipment yeah so it seems like you were helping bring additional meaning to people's work through telling we, we did the finding finding a purpose in people's lives is what it's all about and when you help them realize that they have a purpose individually and they have a purpose within the organization and you help them understand what that purpose is, you can create it and you can tell people what it is, but how the best way to get people to grasp onto it is help them live it and become part of it. And when you bring those stories in and let them become part of the story, now you're letting them understand the impact they have uh, in the world around them. And it's, it's it was very, very powerful. And, a lot of leaders forget to share the stories from the field and their customers. They just share financial results and how well they're doing. But I always encourage them to share the stories of the customers they impact. That's really what's what's most important. Yeah. Okay, so uh, switching to the second um, part of this model, um, you share how important it is to educate people so that they can have ownership of the vision and mission of the organization. Art, could you share with us some methods and approaches that you've used to help leaders in your organization to own the vision and implementation of servant leadership? Yeah, you know, when you say educate to own, uh, one of the comments I make in the book, it's not what you think. Uh, and what I'm trying to get across to people is when we invest in, in people and uh, part of that investment is through educating them uh, in, in various ways, we need to give them an opportunity to use what they've been taught. And how do you go about letting them use that in the organization? And I can I can tell you, you know, I've got three ring binders all over the place where I went to a two day seminar, came back with the best intentions. And that just sat on the shelf because my company didn't let me come back and use the information that I was taught. Uh, they just wanted me to be better. Um, and so what we try and, and teach people is you have a responsibility that when we invest in you, we want to give you the opportunity to use that and invest back in the company. And usually that means that you need to give people some time to learn, make mistakes, learn some more and get better. It isn't that they're going to come back, come back the next week and they're going to be totally different because they're not, because they're going to be trying things and, and learning. So we want them to grasp onto the purpose. And we educate them to help them understand what that purpose is and then give them the tools to help go make that happen. And part of that education process is to give them the time to go use what they've learned. So they do take responsibility for what they've learned and to go, yeah, I know. Art invested in me. He spent a couple thousand dollars to send me to a, a three day 
seminar. Now I know he's going to give me a chance to come back and use the information that I learned. Uh, and that's really important for, for leaders to understand that, that we don't, a lot of times don't give people a chance to use what we've, what we've paid for to, to help them learn. And, and that's difficult for leaders to understand because we really want to change and get better. So give them a chance to change and, and use that as education. Uh, and uh, once you do that, it, it just gets started and you really can't stop it. And that's what I love about it. Once it gets going, it's going in the right direction. And that's when leaders have a lot of fun. Yeah. So what does that empowerment look like, Art? Well, we've got to invest uh, in education. And a lot of times you have to meet people where they are in that education process. Some people learn through reading. Some are a little bit more visual. Some want to talk about it. Some want to have brainstorming. You figure out what's the best way to educate that person about the business and share the knowledge you have. Um, and then give them an opportunity to give you feedback and, and understand how to learn that. Um, that requires you to invest time with them in that education process. And so leaders have to invest their time. Um, I love leaders who, who go, well, you know, I have an open door policy. And I say, well, you know what, tear the door off the wall because I don't care if you have an open door policy, what I care about, you show me where you've put people's names in your calendar. Now you're investing in people because you're intentional about putting people in your calendar and spending time with them. And, and so you've got to do that as, as well. The other thing that we saw that, that really helped people come back and use that education was we have what we call small groups where leaders get together and talk about what they've learned. But more importantly, they share about the difficulties they're having in taking some of that education and, and implementing it in their lives and changing their behavior. And so we create this safe environment in a small group of people that what goes on in small group stays in small group. And I don't set an agenda. I don't tell them what I want to report. I just want them to get together once a month for an hour and talk about what they've done that's been successful, where they've had some challenges and help each other grow without having their boss in the room where they feel like they have to show that they're always moving forward. We know people have struggles when we ask them to change behavior and learn something different. Create that safe environment that gives them a chance to learn and do it in a safe way instead of feeling like they're always on the front line being judged, right? So those are kind of some of the ideas that we try and, and, and come across to help people take the education, own it, and create that environment where they get a chance to use it. So part of being a servant leadership in, in that situation I'm hearing, Art, is that investing in educating people, but then investing in giving people room to grow. It, it is. And, and once they start to catch on to it, then you have to give them the ability to make decisions and let them go make decisions. And they're not going to be perfect. Um, one of the things I encourage leaders to do is, is don't, when you let people go to meetings and you don't go, don't tell them to copy you on all the communications and tell you with the decision, et cetera, because the message you're sending to them is, I trust you to go to the meeting, but I don't trust the decisions you're making. So I want to be involved with it outside the meeting, not inside the meeting. And I, and, and I tell leaders, you don't need to know unless it has a, a, a big impact on where you're going forward as an organization. If someone decides that they need to handle a vendor a little bit differently to get the results that the company needs, why do you need to be involved in that entire process? Let it go and let them go do their job. You've taught them, you've educated them, you've invested time in them, you shared the purpose. Now let them go do their job and get out of the way. And sometimes the best thing we can do in that education process is just get out of the way and let them go learn through making those decisions and growing through those decisions. Yeah. And that seems like something power. that's worth tweeting. The best thing is to get out of the way. <laughs> Sometimes the best thing I can do is not not show up to a meeting. And there's times when I know that when I'm in the room, I'm going to stifle that conversation because I'm the CEO and people don't feel comfortable talking about their challenges and issues in front of the CEO. So the best thing I can do is leave. Serve the group the best way by leaving and letting them have the conversations they need to have without you. And they'll grow faster and become better leaders because of it. Yeah. That's really helpful. So let's talk a little bit about measuring results, Art. Can you share with us how, on this journey to implement servant leadership at Daytron, how you were able, in what way you measured results? 
You know, there, there's a, there's all kinds of uh, measurements you can look at. Engagement is is a hot topic today that a lot of companies uh, measure. You've got financial measurements. What I try and help people understand is start with something you're already measuring, because if you don't improve what you're already measuring, then you're just creating a measure to make you look good, right? And I've been in too many companies where all these measures over here in productivity are great, but the company's losing money. And you go, the two have to coincide together. Um, and so what we found in some of the research we did was there's uh, uh, Stephen M. R. Covey, a great, great knowledgeable guy in trust. Uh, he says the best index that you can do to see the health of your organization is do a trust index. And so we got into doing a trust index. And what we do is we ask twice a year our employees to say yes or no to these answers. Do you trust your boss? Yes or no. It's yes or no answer. You either trust or you don't. And do you trust management? Yes or no. And the first time we did this, the trust the boss was easy. The trust management, I had one of the uh, my folks on the floor uh, manufacturing stand up and say, Art, who's management? And I went, wow, I, 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 have a, I have a different problem now. People don't know who management is. So we got all the managers up on the on stage and said, do you trust this group? Yes or no. If there's someone up here you don't trust, the answer is no. Um, and then we decided that before we asked the leadership team to go build trust, we said, we need to ask the leadership team, do you trust each other? Yes or no. And guess which index was the lowest in trust? It was within the leadership team. So how can I ask my leadership team to go build trust if they don't trust each other? So we started teaching our leaders about trust first. That's who we focused on. And then we built it, built it out from there. Um, you have to find the engagement maybe, or maybe there's a sub measurement. I would encourage you to start with something you're already measuring so you can show that you've improved upon that by implementing a, a different type of leadership culture. If you don't have anything, start with trust because trust will be the, the, the greatest index that will show the health of your organization. Um, and then, you know, we have gross margin measurements. We have cash flow measurements because we're a private company. We have uh, profitability measurements, but we don't make it difficult, um, mainly because we want people to understand it. And most people don't understand what return on EBITDA is. You know, you spend more time explaining what EBITDA is versus, hey, are we doing good or are we doing bad? Um, and so we always said, here's the amount of money cash we have in the bank. We're a private company. Here's what we have in the bank. And we didn't go through all this cash flow accounting definition. We said, how much money do we have in the bank at the end of the quarter? And that's what we shared with people. We told people where we are and we were honest about it. And what we decided to do is whatever we share within the leadership team, our employees get to see the same thing every quarter because it doesn't make sense to do one thing for management and then do something else for the employees. Your employees are smart. Give them the information and let them interpret it the way they want and ask questions of you and your organization will be better off because of it. And so. So that uh, transparency is really powerful. It is. And <clears throat> the other thing we did, excuse me, uh, with our leaders is we asked them to do a short one sentence on what did you do this month in servant leadership that worked? And then we asked them to put into a database what area did you struggle in? That database was open for all leaders to look at. So you were putting it out there for people to, to look at. But what we did when we got together once a quarter was we would ask someone to share. And if they volunteered to share, we let them talk. We never forced people to share in public. We asked for volunteers, but we had to report on ourselves once, once a month. Um, and so we did that measurement. And the other one was we wanted people to invest in the folks that reported to them. So our goal was to spend 20% of our time as leaders in one-on-one -on -one face to face conversations with people. And so we asked leaders to go, how much time did you spend in one-on-one -on -one this, this month? And I said, I don't want a data chart. I don't want a spreadsheet. Tell me what your gut says. You did 10%, 12%, et cetera. We rolled it all up and said, this is how much we did as a management team. We didn't get into individual performance. We didn't do, we just kept track of it. And we saw that improve because we didn't use it as a hammer. Don't use your measurements as a hammer. They have to be something that you reward and recognize in the right direction. And then the last thing I encourage, when we saw leaders who changed their behavior and they were moving in a positive direction, we stuck with them. 
and the leaders that didn't want to change, that just stayed stuck, those were the ones we had to make a decision on whether or not they had a future in the company. But the ones that were changing, you're going to have some leaders that change really fast and other leaders that change really slow. Stick with them if they're changing. Don't, don't throw them out just because they're changing too slow. They will at some point jump up and go, wow, they have grown so much in the last three months because you stuck with them and invested in them. So those are kind of my, my highlights on the measurement. Now, you got, you've got financials, and here's the tough part about servant leadership, is I couldn't put the company on hold and say, I'm going to change the culture and not get results. I had to get results. I had payroll I had to make. Uh, I had families that were relying on the income. I had to perform and deliver products to customers. I couldn't put my company on hold. And it's one of the toughest things I've done is ask leaders to change their behavior, including me. I had to change my behavior first and get results at the same time and do it the right way and get results the right way. That's tough. It's not easy. And so we set the bar really high. Um, just realize that when you set that bar high, you're going to need a lot of grace and a lot of forgiveness because people are going to fall short and that's okay because they're still growing. Stick with them and grow. Yeah. That's really helpful. So let's talk for a few uh, minutes, Art, about the importance of reflection on the servant leadership implementation journey. You know, I, I, Early in my career, I didn't believe too much in reflection, and I reflect more today as a leader than I've ever had in my career. And here's why it's important. I go off and I, and I, I take a behavior, let's say trust, and I teach myself about trust. I go to the internet, I read books, I talk to people. Uh, I'm, I'm, I have a peer group I talk to of CEOs, and I learn about it. Now I have to take what I've learned and go, how does that apply to me? What can I, where, where do I need to improve and how do I need to get better? And once I've thought about that and set a plan for me personally, then I have the question as CEO, what do I need to bring into the organization to help the organization get better? All right. And if I don't think about that, and I don't have a plan to go do that, then I'm going to more than likely fall flat on my face. So that reflection time helps me to go, okay, I've, I've learned this now. How does, how do I have to get better? And what am I going to work on? Where does the organization have to get better? And what are they going to work on? Uh, and now I can put a plan in place. And then once you get through, let's say, your first 90 days of that plan, you sit down and go, okay, Art, how did you do? How did you do in changing your behavior? In the organization, how did you do in changing your behavior this, this quarter? And you start to learn what worked and what didn't work. And the things that worked for you and your organization, that's where you want to spend your time. Don't try and take the things that didn't work. And here's what I believe, Becky. You know, I've, I've, I know... Ken Blanchard, John Maxwell's a, a good friend. Stephen M. R. Covey's amazing. But there isn't one individual out there, management person out there, that can tell you how to run your company. You take bits and pieces from all of them, including me, because what I did at Daytron, it may not work at your organization, and but take bits and pieces, and it's your responsibility now as a leader to reflect and look at all these data points and say, I need to do this and this and this. My organization's not ready for this. This won't work in my organization. This, this, no, I got to stay away from this. You're the best one to say, this is what's going to work in my organization that I need to go implement. Don't take someone's, my book and go implement it. You need to get multiple data points because I'm only part of the solution. There's some things in my what I did are going to work for you and there are other, other things that are not going to work for you. So take it in data points. And the best way to do that is, is spending time with yourself. Turn off your computer, turn off your cell phone, get away from your electronic devices and spend some time with yourself. And the first time you do that, it's scary because your only person in the room is you and you go, okay, what am I supposed to do now? Talk to myself. Well, that's kind of funny. Um, but you can't spend time reflecting while you're reading the news on the internet or answering emails. That's not reflection. And so I always go find a place that I have a private place that doesn't have any of this electronic stuff. I have a great patio that has a view of the ocean. I'm going, that's my place, cup of coffee. I go out there in my chair and I sit and think, and that's my reflection spot. Um, and if you're listening today as a leader, and you've never done this, sometime in the next week, 
take 10 minutes out of your day and go find a reflection spot, spot outside the building or somewhere on a bench or somewhere. Turn your cell phone off. The world will survive without you, without your cell phone on. And spend some time thinking about who you are and who you want to be. And it really does make a difference in, in your life and who you are. And the people around you will see a change. And so it's a very, very important part of the learning process and figuring out how you get better as a leader and how your organization gets better. So Art, I have a question that came in from my friend Jane, and she'd like to know what your advice is for leaders who see reflection time as not being productive. <laughs> uh, I would say that they're not very good leaders. Um, a leader cannot get better without reflection time. Uh, the leader has to continue to learn. They have to continue to invest in themselves before they can invest in other people. And when a leader stops growing, they're going to limit their influence they're going to have on people. People around them are going to know that you've stopped learning. And so people have time to go sit down and reflect. And the first thing I do is go, okay, how much time do you spend reading news on the internet? You can, you can find 15 minutes where you don't have to read the news. Answering emails, answering blah, 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 doing this, doing that, doing that. I've talked to leaders who say, I get 200 emails a day. And I feel like I have to answer every one of them. I said, why can't you offload those to some of your staff? Well, I never thought about that before. So you've got a great staff who's ready to help you and willing to jump in and take on some of the stuff. Let them do that so you can get better for them. Um, I look at reflection as it's a must in my schedule now. It's a must. And I find time every day to spend five or 10 minutes just thinking about where I need to go. And people walk in my office sometimes and I'm staring out the window. I'm reflecting. That's reflection time. You have time to sit and stare out a window. And if you don't, maybe you need a little personal coaching. I can help you through that. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit about uh, how important it is to live with purpose, because you've been referencing that as you talk about reflection, about how you really want to reflect on who the leader is that you want to be. So can you share more with us about that? Yeah. You know, when we first bought, bought the company, we said, what do we want to be and what do we want to do? And the company had been around since the 70s, so it, it had a culture already. We knew we wanted to change it. And we said, okay, what's our purpose as a company? And our purpose we ended up with was we want to positively impact the lives of other people today and in the future. It's not just about selling products. We want our products to positively impact those lives down the road. And so people ask me, Art, how do you do that in your environment? We sell military radios to foreign militaries. And I go, it's easy. Uh, I have a customer in Zimbabwe who said, you know, I, I have elections and people are going to demonstrate. And he says, Art, I need help in controlling those demonstrations with great communications so I don't have to bring out weapons because the people demonstrating are my friends and my family. And I went, Eric, I will help you do that. And so we spent six years giving them equipment, training them. And after about six years, there was an article here in the States that said the recent election in Zimbabwe was the least violent in the country's history. And I took that article and I took it back to got everybody together to come. I said, this is why we do what we do. We help save lives through creating peace so that they didn't have to look at other options. And in Zimbabwe, they just had a coup last year, a peaceful coup. It was done in the right way. And the, and the people there are beautiful, wonderful people who just want to help each other get better. And sometimes our job is to go give them products to help them cut that loose. That purpose for me in helping people floats my boat, keeps me going, gets me to work. And if people ask me, well, what, what makes you come to work? I, I think about that person that I want to help today or want to, I want to help educate or pass some knowledge on to. The things I feel best about at the end of the day is where I've spent time with people like you guys today. I'm going to go home today high on this because I get a chance to pour into your lives and help you see maybe a different thing uh, than you've seen before or hear from a leader who spent a lot of time in the power model who's different now because I found a purpose in my life. Um, and I know that when you find purpose and you find your gift of what you do well, when you do that and incorporate it into everything you do 24-7, your life is going to be happier and the people around you that you love the most are going to be happier because you're happier. Um, and so finding the purpose in your life 
is really important. Finding the purpose in your organization is very, very important. One of my first jobs, Becky, was Disneyland, and I loved what their purpose was when I worked there. Their purpose was we want to make people smile. They didn't talk about rides. They didn't talk about entertainment. They, they said, we want people to smile. And so in our purpose, we just want to positively impact their lives uh, and give them something that they can take forward with them. And when we live that purpose, it takes on a total, total different meaning in life. Um, at a CEO of a large software company, I visited back east. He had a 300 acre uh, um, campus. And he was looking as people were going out the door, it was about four o'clock. And he says, you know, you know, my role is to make sure the people that leave the gate and leave the campus want to come back on the campus the next morning, that they want to come to work and be part of the purpose and, and what we do in the organization. And um, I always tell people, when you find your why, you'll find your way. And so if you haven't found your your way yet, maybe you start with asking, what's your why? Why are you here? What, what do you, what do you, why do you do what you do? And do the same thing with your organization. And when you find that purpose, guess what? Things are gonna be amazingly turned around for you as an individual and, and as an organization, yeah. That's really helpful. So I know that one of the things you touch on in the book, Art, is how to lead in difficult and challenging times. And one of the things I picked up on from that is that culture in our organizations is something that's fragile. So can you share with us a bit more about, you know, why that is and what we as leaders can do about it? Yeah, you can spend your time changing the culture in your company, in your organization, in your department, whatever, whatever you're part of. Uh, what I've learned over the years is that culture is fragile unless you work at it in, in uh, all the time. All companies go through tough times, all of them. Um, I don't know of any company who doesn't go through tough times. Um, great example, Southwest, you know, they, they, they have a, a history of not having layoffs. They're going through a tough time right now because of some things that have happened to their equipment. It isn't a matter of when or, you're, or, or whether or not you're going to have tough times in your organization. It's a matter of when. And what I encourage leaders to do is don't throw out all the work you've done with the culture when times get tough. That's when you really have to stick to your guns. You have to stick with your culture because that new culture is going to help you come out of those tough times faster and better because you have a different mindset when you're in it. A lot of people who've tried to change cultures, when times get tough, they go back to where they're comfortable. And that's the power model, telling people what to do. And I will tell you, your, your company will stagnate and won't grow and will actually go back a little bit because you're not continuing to grow and invest in that culture. So it's easy to grow leaders and easy and when times are great. It's tough to grow leadership when you have to consider, you know, letting people go because you don't have the business. You don't have, you know, things aren't going right. Maybe your margins aren't where they want to be or you didn't get the big contract. Um, and so you're going to have those tough times and are you going to deal with those tough times as a power leader or a servant leader? And a lot of people ask me, Art, what's that mean? I said, well, we all, all have had layoffs in our career. And what astounds me is the day before the layoff, we trusted the people that were working for us. The day we tell them we can't keep them employed, we escort them to their office, we watch them pack up their things, we cut them off on the computer because we don't trust that they're gonna react the right way. I'm going, we trusted them the day before, but just because I couldn't do my job, we don't trust them anymore? Give me a break. We do trust them. So let them say goodbye to the people they just spent the last five or 10 years with, working with every day. Let them go take the day and close out their time at your company the right way. Um, that's tough for leaders to grow in those environments because they're so focused on, you know, a lot of companies go into survival, what I call survival mode. And uh, you've got to grow in those tough times. And what happens is the leaders that grow the most in tough times become much better leaders in good times because now they know how to deal with the bad times and the tough times. And so don't give up the culture change that's going on in the organization just because times get tough. You're going to have tough times. You're on the right path, keep going on that path. Don't get sidetracked just because you didn't have a quarter or two or six months of tough times. Yeah, yeah. That's really powerful. So Art, one of the things I was impressed with in reading your company uh, vision and mission 
was this idea of sustainability and you know that you wanted to create an organization not only one that was profitable now but one that's sustainable over time so as a servant leader as a servant leader how can you ensure that your organization can survive without you yeah you know i i love the graphic my team came up with with this because this is a ruins um and you know when, when you always if you've been to ruins before i've been to giraffes quite a bit i always look around and see these columns that have sustained and 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 they they're still standing today when they were built thousands of years ago why is that part of it still standing and the rest of it isn't and i look at cultures and i go we're going to change our culture to be a servant-led company if we don't stay on top of that and sustain it I'm going to have some pillars that are going to stay standing, but the rest of it's going to crumble. And so you have to work at sustaining the culture you put in. Don't fall into the trap that once you get there, that it's just going to take care of itself. It's not. Look, do a search on the on the term uh, mission drift, and there's some books out, out there on mission drift, and it talks about organizations that started with a great purpose. And over time, their founders have left, the people have left, and the company changes or the organization changes. And all of a sudden, they're not doing what they originally set out to do. And their culture has changed, and now it's not sustainable. Um, Jim Collins did some great work here. He looked at companies that performed over a 15-year period that sustained their performance instead of just being great for three or four years or five years and then falling off the cliff. And that 15 year sustainability is really what we're after. How do we put the culture in place and make sure it stays in place? And it requires you to bring people on board, make them part of the culture, invest in them, educate to own, give them empowerment, do all the things that you did when you went in and changed the culture. And um, so that's why I love the graphic because I don't want to have a company that has some pillars standing and the rest of it's crumbled because we didn't pay attention to it. Yeah. That is a powerful image. So the next slide is really, really interesting because it outlines your process at Daytron World and how you over, I guess, the past 14 years have been implementing servant leadership through this roadmap. So uh, we are getting close on time if we're going to take questions, but maybe you can uh, share a few highlights with us about the implementation journey for Daytron. Yeah, you know, I, I take questions all the time about you start and then you work at it and you end up to where you want to get and everything's great. And I'm going, no, that's not the process. So what we've done is we've taken every chapter and said, these are these are the major areas that we worked on, but I need to break it down and show you that it's a transition. And so in the reds, those were our survival times. We were actually, we bought the company. We had to figure out how to survive, make payroll, make sure we we're getting cash in, serving customers, putting a mission purpose, define how we're going to do business and values. And then the outlined areas that are filled in with blue, those were the time that we had to learn about each one. And then we started the yellow implementation phase, which is how much time we spent implementing what we learned and working at it. And you can see there's some short yellows and then there's some long yellows. And then we went to green to where we thought we had it. And then you see we go back to yellow because we really didn't have it. We needed to mature more and learn more. And it really took us almost 10 years to get to the point where we saw green across the board in all these major areas. And so changing a culture is an up and down process. You're gonna go like this through this process. And sometimes you need to step back from the time where you think you've got it and go back to the education side, learn some more, ask some more questions, challenge you, go back and implement what you learn before you're gonna get it. And there were a couple of years in here where we had some very, very difficult times and what I can share with people is in those difficult times, we got through them faster and better because we had a better culture, because people trusted each other. They trusted what management was telling them. When we when I sat with people at Corley's, I would say, listen, we're not in great shape right now. Here's why we're doing everything we can to, to get better. And then I would open it up to questions and I would say, I'm here to answer any question you have. I'll stay here all afternoon and answer all your questions fire away. And my commitment to stay there and answer all the questions was very powerful. And I knew there were some questions people had that they wouldn't ask and open and said, and then I would take the approach to go, guys, if I was in your shoes, this is the question I would ask. So I'd ask myself the question and answer it. Um, and, and that's part of the process. So 
you're not going to take each one of these and start, learn, implement, and be great at it. It's going to be an ongoing process. And there's some line items here. We're probably going to go back to yellow in a year or two because we brought in new leaders. We brought in new people. I've got to bring people on board. And it's okay to go back and forth because that just means you're getting better and you're open to more learning. Um, and it was very powerful for us to do this because we knew we'd gone through the process, but we were feeling pretty good about ourselves. But we went, no, we struggled here. We struggled here. We, we, we went back and forth a couple of times here. So we're trying to help people understand it's a process and it will take you almost eight years to change a culture that's, that's in place. That's a proven well, and fact. One of the things, one of the yeah. things that's remarkable to me about this art is that you not took Daytron on the servant leadership journey of implementing a, a radically different culture in the way that you dealt with your people. But during this window of time that we're looking at, you grew the financial uh, results of the company in a huge way. And I don't want to say the numbers out loud unless you're willing to, but um, <laughs> can you tell us what 2004 looked like compared to today? Yeah, you know, it's it's in 2004 where you see all the red. We were we did about $10 million. Um, we were losing money at the time, uh, 10 million annually in sales. Uh, over the first six or seven years, we grew the company to about 200 million. Uh, record cash, record profits during that time frame, And those are all the times we were learning and in the yellows. We hadn't really got it yet. Uh, but people were learning to trust each other. We were getting things done faster. And then we got into, we do most of our business overseas. So the international arena impacts our business. So we slowed down. And then about a year and a half ago, we signed a record contract uh, worth $495 million. And we went, wow, we couldn't have done this without all the great people that worked for us and all the effort uh, that went in to learn a different culture, implement a different culture, serve a customer, because the customer saw a difference in us. And one of our customers in the Middle East recently approached me in London last year and said at a trade show and said, Art, I want you to know that you and your company have served our country from your heart more than any other company we've dealt with. Now, this is an entire country. And they're telling me that we served them from their heart. And that's probably the best compliment that a customer could make to me is we've served them with our products, but it's been backed up with a heart of people. And you, yeah, you, can't, so you, can't, you, can't, you can't come up with that um, because that's the impact you're gonna have when you serve people with the right motive of helping them meet their mission and help them accomplish what they're trying to, to, to accomplish, yeah, yeah. So I think the Daytron story is such a powerful one for any leader who would have resistance to the idea of serving or serving um, their organization um, because you've proven that this type of culture can create tremendous results You know not only the people results, but also the financial results It is uh, and I, I love CEOs who say, you know, it, it doesn't work. I said well Let me share some numbers with you and then you can tell me if it didn't work or not um, You know when we first got started in 2004 about the company we had some some big competitors who were public companies who told our customers we wouldn't survive, that we wouldn't, we'd be out of business in two years. And and now we're 14, 15 years later, and now those same people who said we wouldn't survive have to explain to the customer why we're still around and still helping people and, and successful. And people won't understand why you're successful when you start serving from your heart. Because the world, business world, doesn't understand business from the heart of a leader. Uh, and it will will set you apart in the marketplace. Guarantee me, it will set you apart in the marketplace because customers will see that. Yeah. So let's talk for a moment about the ultimate measures of success of this student leadership uh, experience. And Aubrey, uh, you can go to the next slide. Oh, you know, the ultimate measure, uh, according to to uh, Mr. Greenleaf, is do the people you serve get better? Do the people you help do they grow? Do they get better? And I think that's a great measure. Uh, for me, I think it's the second measure that, that I like to talk about. And that is, are people better off after they come in contact with you? Um, and people go, well, yeah, most people are. I mean, they're my friends, they're my family. I said, no, no, no. If you run into someone at the store 
who bangs your shopping cart, are they better off after their experience with you because you said, excuse me, I'm sorry, I bumped your cart, or do they get a person who goes, watch where you're going, you bang me, you blah, 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 right? Um, are people better off when you come in contact with them? And in our environment today, we have a lot of people who are suffering, a lot of people out of work, don't have homes, and you run across people that go and they're just trying to, to get better in life. Um, do you help those people out in the five seconds or 20 seconds? Do you say hi to them? Do you, do you say, hey, I, I, things are going to get better? Do you give them a little bit of money? Do you, do you lead them with a positive feeling about life or do you just kind of ignore them? Um, and one thing I learned over my last 14 years is one of the worst things we can do for people is treat them with indifference. Uh, when you run into people, smile, say hi to them, ask them how they're doing, etc., cetera, um, and show that you care about them instead of ignoring them and looking the other way. And so if you come in contact with someone today at the supermarket, ask yourself, are they better at, off after they pass me in the aisle because I smiled at them and got out of their way? Or am I the person that makes this making them move and get out of the way? Uh, or the same thing at the gas station or on the road. Um, are they better off after they come in contact with you? Because when you do that, your behavior is letting, your behavior speaking for you, not your words. And when people see that you behave differently, that's more powerful than saying you're going to change. Your behavior actually speaks for yourself. And I think servant leadership today can be taught and a, be a great example of what a leader should be through how they behave not with what they say. Don't walk your talk, behave your talk. Let your behaviors do your talking for you and that's gonna become a better measure on where you are as a servant leader. That's the ultimate measure to me. Do people feel great after they see you or do they go, oh man, I gotta see Art in the hallway again. I don't, I, he doesn't smile, he doesn't say hi. Or, or, or. No, I want, I want people to feel good after they've come in contact with me, yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk about the legacy that you're wanting to create in the world, Art. Well, you know, it's it's um, the Servant Leadership Institute is our legacy, and, and I, I love this graphic too because it made me think. You know, do I want to be a beat up old Ford or Chevy in a field somewhere that's grasping onto my old ways, or do I want to try and help build future leaders? And for me, it meant if I wanted wanted to get out of this field and not be a rusted old, up old car, I had to go understand how best teach this generation that's coming up and for me um, um, you know I'm, I'm in my early 60s I had to learn Twitter Instagram I had to get involved with social media LinkedIn Facebook I'm going I don't want to get involved in this stuff but what I've learned is I can impact and influence more people through that social medium than I can from picking up the phone and talking to people because that's what I'm used to pick up the phone and talk if you want to reach a lot of people and influence a lot of people, you have to be in this world and you have to change the way you think. Uh, the younger leaders coming up today, uh, we're being told are going to have between 20 and 25 jobs in their career because they're looking for purpose. And if they don't find purpose in their work, they're going to leave and go find somewhere where they do have purpose. And so we have two years on average to impact a life. Instead of 10 or 15 years when ICE got in the workforce, you stayed with the company for 10 years. You don't have that today. Um, but you also notice that my name is not attached to the Servant Leadership Institute. And what I believe is servant leadership is greater than the individual that's behind the organization. And so you'll never see my name on the Servant Leadership Institute uh, name of the company because I want servant leadership to be the legacy, not Art Barter. Um, and I was with a group of CEOs yesterday and we were talking about legacy and I asked the question, what does legacy mean to you? Is the legacy you're trying to protect your own that's individual or the purpose of the organization or you just want to protect the income that you're going to get? What, what does that mean to you? Uh, said, Oops, good. Sorry. Uh, and, and the group said, you know what? That's a great question. Right, we got to spend some time talking about that because we're not sure what legacy means. Um, and for me, I want Servant Leadership Institute to thrive, impact, teach leaders, influence organizations well after I'm gone. 
I don't want it to go off the earth just because I'm not here anymore. And so that's my legacy is how do I teach as many leaders as I can to be great servant leaders and pass on information and raise up more servant leaders. So this movement is going strong well after the time I've left this earth. Yeah. That's really powerful. Well, we've had a lot of questions coming into the question panel. We have a few more minutes, but the next slide uh, shows a really practical um, approach that people can take to begin to implement servant leadership. So could you give us some high points on how folks might be able to use this 90 day travel plan? Yeah, you know, you've got to start a, start off on the upper left hand corner is where you're going and how you're going to get there, how you're going to communicate. The right hand corner is here's what we're trying to accomplish. So here's where we want to go. Here's the results we're looking for. The center part of the box is, OK, here's the things we need to change to, 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 to do the purpose we want and to get the results we want. Here's what we have to do to change is in the middle. And it kind of takes you through some steps to help you with that. And then the reflection process is below. And then those are the four steps we put in our servant leadership behavior journal. Those are the four steps that we go through. And every 90 days, you set a plan, you see how you're doing with your purpose. Here's what we're trying to accomplish in 90 days. Here's what we're trying to change in the middle. And then at the end of 90 days, you go through this reflection process and reset your plan again. What did I learn? What worked? What did we try that didn't work? Go focus on the things that did work. And how do I get better in those areas and start that process all over again? And it could be a 90 day, 180 day, whatever works for you. It could be a 30 day. Uh, but it really is upper left hand corner. Here's why we do what we do. Here's where we want to go in the right hand corner in the middle. Here's what we need to do to change. And then at the end of night, that period, I'm going to reflect to see how I did so I can learn and get better. And that's, that's so a, a, a nice little available to download on the servant leadership Institute website by chance art. We could put a link to this in our follow up email. We'll do that. Yeah, we can do that. Yep. That'd be great. Okay. No problem. Super. Well, let's dive into some of the questions. I'm going to go back to a question that came in before we actually even started the event. And Dan is wondering how you can get buy-in from the C-suite on this idea of servant leadership. Yeah, I get the question all the time. My, my senior leaders in the company don't believe in servant leadership, and that's okay. They, they want to call it authentic leadership or, or something else, and, and that's okay. I will encourage you to start where you are and start with yourself. You don't need permission from any leader in your organization to treat people with dignity and respect. You can do that on your own. You don't need permission to do that. And so if you go about in your work and say, and this is kind of some of the things we learned in the process. If you have someone in your organization that you know needs the information you have, don't wait for the email or the phone call. Go give it to them. Say, hey, I think you need this. Do you want it? Give it to them. If you need something from somebody in your, in your department, Go ask for it. Don't wait for them to give it to you or go through the channels, etc. Now you still have to follow your process in your company. I'm not telling you to throw that out, but what I'm telling you is you start with your own behavior first and change who you are, and you become a servant leader. Your organization is going to catch on, and you're going to get better. You're going to perform better, and at some point in time, somebody outside your department or group is going to go, "What's going on down there with art?" Because all of a sudden, his group is performing and they're getting some great results. I need to go down and find out what's going on. And I've seen more organizations change from the inside out without the permission of the senior leadership team. And when that group performs and starts to exceed expectations, that's when you have the forum now to share what you're doing. And now they're going to be open to what you have to say. Change first. Do your performance outperform expectations and then you're going to be asked and go how did you do that now you have an opportunity to start spreading the, the servant leadership uh approach and model so start with yourself it starts with you yep sure so daryl is wondering um and mentioning that your idea of the trust index of measuring trust in your organization was really gutsy and he's wondering if you had any reservations about asking those bold questions you know do you trust each other do you trust me you know, um, I, I spent a lot of time uh, researching that with Stephen M. R. Covey, and I knew his father, um, and I first heard him speak about, about the power of trust. And here's the one story that that, that um, Covey Sr. told in a conference I went to. He says, you know, I was asked to come into the U.N. and help them 
solve a problem because everybody was talking over each other. They couldn't get things done. And he worked with them for a while and he finally implemented the talking stick rule. And he said, I brought in this talking stick and I said, as long as you're holding the stick, you can talk. But if you don't hold the stick in your hand, you can't talk. Now think about the power of leaders at the UN who have to have a stick to talk. <laughs> and that was so simple to, to, to get this group to respect and listen to each other. I went, well, okay, Covey's onto something here. He's onto something. And so I took the step to try and do this. And we didn't ask the question in the leadership team, did you trust each other? That was probably the index question that scared me the most because that was going to be a reflection on me. Do, do people in my organization trust me? Um, so we started with the two questions first that Covey says, do you trust your boss and do you trust management? But then I realized that my leadership team didn't trust each other. I need to start there. And that was the lowest index in in the company. I've shared those indexes in the book. All that, all that data is there for you to look at and see what, what happened there. Um, I don't have any reservations on doing that. I had to be ready for some of the answers that came out of it, especially when it was me and my other 30 leaders in the organization saying we didn't trust each other because some of the people didn't trust me. And I had to be ready to, to, to be mature enough to accept that and then learn what I could do to help build the trust in the organization with them. And it took us a while, but we finally hit 100%. Uh, it took about seven, eight years before we hit 100% in the leadership team. Wow. Yep. Well, there's probably a lot more we could learn from you on that topic, Art. <laughs> that you, you, you have to be op open to that, <laughs> that feedback back to you because some of that feedback is going to be negative on you, and you have to be ready for that, not to defend yourself, but to listen to what's being said, go off and reflect and listen to it. Uh, I learned that I wasn't a great leader, uh, a listening leader, and I went home uh, depressed one night on a Friday night and told and Lori said, my wife said, something's wrong. What's wrong? I said, I found out today that I'm not a great leader. And her comment was, tell me something I don't already know. <laughs> and I went home to get, looking for support from her, and she confirmed that what I heard that day was right. And if I loved the people around me, I had to learn to become a better listener. And what I learned through my study was listening is a form of love. And if you care about people, you're going to listen to them. Uh, but I had to be ready to go learn and get better in that arena. And if you're not ready for that, uh, don't put your people in that position to where they're going to get your wrath instead of your love. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a few questions that we didn't make it to today. If you um, put in a question that we didn't get to, I'm going to pass those along to Art. And Art, perhaps you can address those in a future blog post or a future podcast conversation. Um, if you want to learn more from Art, um, we're going to put up the next slide. Um, you can connect uh, with him to uh, buy the new book, The Art of Servant Leadership 2. It's available on Amazon and other great booksellers. I hope that if you enjoyed the session, you'll go and get this book today. Um, you can also connect uh, either with Art and his individual channels or the Servant Leadership Institute or both and follow them on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, all the great places where we like to hang out. And Art, I want to thank you so much for investing your energy and sharing your insights with us. It's an amazing journey that you've been on with Tron, and I can't wait to continue to be connected and hear from you. Yeah, it's, it's great. Thank you, everybody, for investing your time. Uh, go to ServantLeadershipInstitute.com. We're starting to set up conference calls to where you just hang out with me, and we have a little small group meeting. I answer your questions. We have talks. We're just starting to get into that now. So keep an eye on Servant Leadership Institute. Get on our mailing list. You'll find out when I'm going to have those phone calls. And we just sit and answer questions and we talk for about an hour. And it's, it's been very powerful for me and very helpful for people. So keep an eye out for that. And you can join us on a future call. It'd be great. So lots more uh, opportunities to learn from Art Barter. Um, yep. And I'll say that URL one more time, ServantLeadershipInstitute.com. Thanks, yep. everyone. Have a great Thank rest you, of your day. Thanks, Becky. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye.